So this is a new beginning. This is the launch, the official launch of the Working Life TV show. Welcome to our world headquarters studio. Fancy bookcases behind me. I put them together myself. I'm sure you've had that kind of headache task in the past as well. So you know the pain I've gone through to build this amazing, beautiful studio. So have a little patience with me and the crew. We're going to be working at this over the next few weeks. We're going to add some bells and whistles. We're going to upgrade it, but it's going to take a little time. Do send us any feedback at jtassini at workinglife.org. We certainly want to hear from you. To my audio listeners, I want to reassure you that we're going to continue giving you the same content through the audio podcast, if that's what you prefer. If you want to do double duty, you can sign up. If you're listening to the audio cast right now, you can go over to YouTube, youtube.com slash working life with Jonathan Tassini. If you'd like to also sign up to that YouTube video show, but you will still get that content through the audio cast. Although I am thinking potentially of adding an extra segment in the video show. So wouldn't want you to miss that. Our veteran audio podcast listeners know that this podcast is sponsored by a major sponsor, the American Postal Workers Union, which fights for dignity and respect for its 200,000 United States Postal Service employees and its retirees and 2,000 private sector mail workers. But of course, we really are going to thrive and be able to build this show and expand it based on contributions and support from lots of small donations and lots of subscribers and donors. So you can do that in two ways. You can go over to workinglife.org, click on the podcast tab, which will show you a little link to Patreon or, and this is a new development, you can also donate to us through Act Blue, which lots of people are very familiar with through, I guess, political contributions. So go over to Act Blue and look for the Working Life Network and become one of our regular sponsors. Or if you want one-time sponsors, one-time donors, we'd love it. We'd appreciate it. Every single dollar will go towards fancy bookcases like the ones behind me. To set up my opening rant, I want you to watch and listen to this clip of a speech that was given in 1967 by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and it was called The Other America. But we must see that the struggle today is much more difficult. It's more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. And it's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee a livable income and a good, solid job. It's much easier to guarantee the right to vote than it is to guarantee the right to live in sanitary, decent housing conditions. It is much easier to integrate a public park than it is to make genuine quality integrated education a reality. And so today we are struggling for something which says we demand genuine equality. It's not merely a struggle against extremist behavior toward Negroes. And I'm convinced that many of the very people who supported us in the struggle in the South I'm not willing to go all the way now. I came to see this in a very difficult and painful way in Chicago over the last year where I've lived and worked. Some of the people who came quickly to march with us in Selma and Birmingham were active around Chicago. And I came to see that so many people who supported morally and even financially what we were doing in Birmingham and Selma were really outraged against the extremist behavior of Bull Connor and Jim Clark toward Negroes rather than believing in genuine equality for Negroes. Okay, so zero in on what he said. He basically said very explicitly at the end that allies at the time in white America were outraged at the racist tactics by the segregationists in the South, especially the police who are beating up, jailing, and in many cases killing blacks who are protesting, sitting at lunch counters, marching across bridges, trying to break down segregation. It was a theme that King would come back to throughout his life, and that is the direct tie between racism, explicit racism, like the kind of racism that we see on the part of police who kill 
black people in their communities and economic oppression. In fact, you may know that the day before he was assassinated in Memphis, Dr. King was marching with striking sanitation workers in Memphis. He always saw the direct tie, the link between racism and economic exploitation, economic oppression. Here's how he put it at a different time. And I'm going to quote now very briefly from a speech he gave. White America has allowed itself to be indifferent to race prejudice and economic denial. It has treated them as superficial blemishes, but now awakes to the horrifying reality of a potentially fatal disease. The urban outbreaks, and he was talking again back in the 1960s, are a fire bell in the night, clamorously warning that the seams of our entire social order are weakening under strains of neglect, which so perfectly echoes to today. So here we are, in fact, as hundreds of thousands of people are massing in the streets. And at the same time, we're being inundated by this campaign of public relations and corporate statements and corporate commercials trying to embrace what is happening in the streets. And it's coming from the scar of all of us, Jeff Bezos and Amazon, or Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, and even something called the Hedge Fund Association. Company after company falling over itself to show enlightenment, even embracing sometimes the slogan, Black Lives Matter. Now, this is so hypocritical, it's sickening. Because if the people are able to win the unwinding of the militarization of our cities by the police and the abuse and the killing of black people by police, that's only half the battle. And all of this corporate posturing, this PR bullshit, really hides the depth of the second part that King was talking about. And that is how the corporate boot remains firmly on the neck of black Americans and all Americans, but especially people of color. Yes, police are killing African Americans with guns and chokeholds, but corporations are killing huge numbers of African Americans by grinding people down with poverty wages and inhumane working conditions. Now, I can rattle off a whole bunch of statistics, and I don't want to drown you in statistics, but consider this. White families have 10 times the wealth that black families have. And that's something that is an accumulation of decades, actually going back two centuries and longer. And wealth is really, really important as a measure because the more wealth you have, that's either you own a house or you have a little money in your bank account, that wealth allows you to weather a crisis or two, such as the one we're in right now with the pandemic. And that's one reason that people of color, especially black Americans, are even in more dire straits because of the economic crisis and the unemployment, the vast unemployment that is sweeping the country. It is absolutely the truth that the corporate goal, and Amazon and Jeff Bezos are foursquare and leaders in this, is to destroy the labor movement, to destroy unions. And unions have been a road for lots of workers, but certainly for black workers to lift up their wages. And I don't want to minimize the racism that many blacks faced inside unions over many years. I think that's changed in many unions, but it's still there. And it certainly is not something that should be forgotten or covered up. So let's not let the corporate PR machine that is simply trying to figure out a way to make money through statements and platitudes, let's not, as Dr. King always said, let them make America forget that racism and economic oppression are tightly tied together. Let's not shy away from raising that point, enhancing it, and pushing as hard as we can for the end of economic racism at the same time that everyone is doing everything possible to end the killing of blacks in the hands of the police. One of the things that we all read about a lot these days is the apparent collapse of the unemployment system. And when I mean collapse, it's literally people unable to reach on the phone or through a website that's crashing when you're trying to apply for unemployment. People cannot reach or access the unemployment benefits that are coming to them. And that has a real practical effect. People don't have money 
in their pockets, right? It's one of the reasons that you see these long lines at pantries and at food banks. People don't get an unemployment check, and that means they're out of money and they have to feed their families. So they have to walk down or drive down to the food bank, to the pantry, sometimes for the first time in their lives. The unemployment system is teetering and on the brink of the collapse. Now, this is no surprise. The unemployment system was never built in a robust way. It was never meant to really make sure that we care for people who are unemployed almost always, not because of their decision. Most unemployment happens because of the decisions made in the corporate suites by the CEOs that keep making millions of dollars who keep piling up their benefits and pension while they cast off tens of thousands of people. That's on a good day, and I say that sarcastically. Now you have this vast unemployment, tens of millions of people out of work, unemployed or underemployed, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and this unemployment system can't cope with the surge of people who are trying to get access to the benefits that they are legally entitled to. So I thought that this would be a good time to look at the system and to actually try to offer some practical advice and some practical guidelines for so many people who are trying to access the system and get just that small amount of money because it never is the same amount of money that you made in your salary. It's at best 40% of what you're, you made, but at least give some people some guidelines on how they can access the system. And so I wanted to invite onto the program somebody who's been on our show before, Judy Conti, who is the Director of Government Affairs for the National Employment Law Project. NELP has been on the audio cast many, many times. And as I talk to Judy, we're going to use some slides. I know that's a terrible thought. Oh my God, slides, PowerPoints. We're going to use some slides that highlight some points that I think will focus people. People can jot them down. And for my audio listeners, I will post those at workinglife.org at the link for the audio podcast. Now, the main thing, Judy, that I think we have to start with, and the whole idea of us talking was to give all these millions of people a sense of what it's like actually to engage the unemployment system in this chaos. But I think, first of all, before we go through some of the specifics and the great slides that you've prepared, and I say this also for my audio cast listeners, that I'm going to post those slides at our website so you can actually go through them, but we will talk about them in enough detail so you'll understand it. I mean, the first thing is this system has always been rickety and kind of almost stuck together with a little scotch tape and gum, and the pandemic simply exposed how underfunded, how understaffed the system is, right? Right. Yes, the, the, the unemployment insurance system, first of all, it was built in the late 1930s. It was a New Deal program, and it was built for an economy primarily where there was a single bread earner in the family who was a man who worked full time to support everybody else. So in the first instance, it's a system that has been built for days gone by and not terribly updated since then. But beyond that, you, you hint at the severe administrative problems with the system. Um, and it is one that is marked by persistent underfunding. For the past four decades, quite frankly, um, Congress has every single year, Democrat, Republican alike, funded the administration of UI programs either at level amounts or at decreases. As the workforce has grown, as people's jobs become more unsteady, as with a, a labor market economy is marked by more turnover and churn than ever before, we're funding UI systems less and less and less and less. And what's now, happened is that we've got, pe we've got states running their UI systems on computer technology that was built in the 80s, some of them not updated at all, and others that have updated, they've done a patch here and a patch there and a patch here. And to say that they are held together in some instances by bubble gum and scotch tape is not really an exaggeration. Hmm. And, and, they're, and we knew this full well. We had all of these problems in the Great Recession. It was hard for the states to reprogram, to keep up with the changes, to keep up with the sheer volume of 
claimants. And, and we're dealing with you know, seven and eight times the amount of claimants that we had at the worst of the Great Recession. So we, we knew these problems were coming. We didn't do anything about them. And here we are in perhaps the worst crisis of unemployment in our country's history, including maybe even the Great Depression, and we're not at all ready for it. So you mentioned that Congress is underfunding the UI system. Increasingly, every year it's being underfunded by Democrats and Republicans, and that's the federal level. But isn't there a sense of ideology that also shapes what's happening at the state level? In other words, if you look at the different fundings that state give unemployed people, and mm -hmm. the states do define the weekly benefits and they can shift, mm -hmm. 50 states may have 50 different levels, and we will talk a little bit about that. A lot of that is also driven by simply ideology that certainly Republicans, but generally there's a sense among the elites that when you're unemployed, it's something wrong with you and that you really shouldn't be supported in a very robust way. Yeah, it's, it's important to first of all make a distinction that um, unemployment insurance is a federal state system. It's mm. this sort of unique hybrid. Employers pay a small tax every year to the federal government, about $56 per worker. And that's the money that is used to fund administration of the programs throughout the country. Some states do add money to the admin funds as well, but many exist just on the federal money. But then the states have the ability to determine what employer taxes are going to be paid into their trust funds. And that's how the UI money is then spent when people are out of work. And the states, for the most part, get to set the duration of benefits. Most of them are 26 weeks, but there are eight states where it is lower. They set the maximum amount that you can get. And for the most part, um, blue states have higher maximum benefit levels. Mm -hmm. And um, the lowest benefit levels we see, sometimes as low as two or $250 a week, are in the southeastern states. Um, they set the terms of eligibility. And we have certainly seen in the past decade that some of the, the more traditionally red states, as we call them, have been making it harder and harder, both in terms of the eligibility for benefits um, through state law, but also building increasingly impenetrable systems that people have to navigate through the internet in order to get their benefits in the first place. So it is, to underscore the point that we started with, it is, often driven, a large part driven by ideology. If, if you, what you just said is true. Yes, and, and the ideology got worse in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Hmm. In, in unfortunately all too typical American fashion, we didn't really have the patience for the level and length of recovery that we needed to have. And when there were still three or four unemployed people for every job opening that there was, so it, it's not like there were even jobs for most people to go back to, all of a sudden the narrative shifted from we have to support unemployed workers to what's wrong with them that they're not back at work yet? Why are they sitting at home collecting benefits? We, we talk in the UI world about moral hazard, that mm. if your benefits are too generous, perhaps you'll rather stay home and collect benefits than go to work. Yeah. Um, and, and we've and heard that now in the recent pandemic support, which we'll get to in a second about right. those Republicans now objecting that God forbid people right. get $600 a week extra to get them through when you actually do the math for lots of people that barely will pay the bills as it is. Exactly, and, and, and that's nothing new. The, the vitriol that we saw though, uh, towards the long-term unemployed, including the, the um, frequent occurrence in job announcements of no, no unemployed people need apply. Right? Like they didn't, employers didn't even want to look at people who were struggling to find work anymore, as if it was somehow their own moral failing that in the midst of a recession, they happened to be unemployed and couldn't get a new job because there were no more jobs to be had. Mm. So we saw a whole wave of states cutting numbers of weeks of benefits people were eligible for, for the first time go, going below a, a minimum of 26 weeks. We saw states make conditions harder for people to qualify in the first place. We saw benefit levels decrease, even as the cost of living across the country was increasing. 
And we saw a few states in particular, and Florida is one of them, and I mentioned Florida because it's been in the news a lot lately, that did get new technology and did build a new system and built it to fail. They literally built it to make it as hard as possible for people to get benefits in the first instance. Mm. Made it so hard and so time consuming and so impenetrable that people just gave up halfway through and didn't even keep going. Mm. Or if they did keep going, they made so many little errors along the way that it rendered them ineligible. Okay, and before we go to the practicalities of applying for unemployment and why the system was in chaos, and really that was the point of this show, I say, to my audience that we really wanted to help people, many of whom probably had never gone through this system that for the first time in their lives are engaging with the unemployment system and are finding this incredible chaos. And it's very frustrating and depressing and people waste a lot of time day after day. And sometimes people give up because it's too frustrating. I wanna to go to that in a second, but I do wanna point out one thing that came up in the news recently, there was this momentary blip where people say, oh my goodness, the unemployment level is dropping and there's not as many people actually applying for unemployment benefits. And then we found out that the statistics were actually wrong, that the Bureau of Labor Statistics was actually classifying people wrong. And that made a difference of about three or so percent in the unemployment rate, right? So answer that in a very brief way if you can. Sure. What, what we're going through now, and we'll talk about this more as the, the program goes on, um, we've got unemployment insurance, we've got pandemic unemployment assistance, a new program that was created for this moment. We've got some systems that aren't fully reprogrammed and ready to handle all of this yet. And because of how antiquated the systems are, and because of the delays in properly classifying people for the type of benefits that they're eligible for or, or misclassifying whether they're eligible in the first instance or not, mm. we've got this dramatic undercounting right now of mm. who's actually unemployed. Mm. It's, it's nothing, I, I've heard people talk about how this seems like yet another way that the Trump administration is trying to cook, to cook the statistics or to lie to us about what's happening. I, I don't want to suggest that it's anything as sinister as that because mm. the Bureau of Labor Statistics is being very transparent about the failures of the data that they are getting from the states um, and put an explicit note in the, the monthly report saying that this is an undercounting by probably about 3%. But again, it is endemic of those antiquated systems that can't handle what they're seeing right now, mm. can't be adequately reprogrammed to handle two different systems at a time and can't keep up with the flow of what they're seeing even in regular unemployment insurance. And as a result, there are people that, that should be in the system and should be counted, but aren't yet. So the numbers aren't fully accurate as the Bureau of Labor Statistics very transparently admitted. And I would guess that that probably puts the actual unemployment rate because also people who even work just one hour are considered to be employed. So if you actually add up the unemployment rate and the underemployed rate, meaning Correct. people who would like to work full time, but are just piecing together, you know, an hour here, five hours here, just to try to actually probably get enough money just to maybe buy lunch that day, you're really looking at an unemployment rate and an underemployment rate in the 20 percentiles, 20%, 25%, and higher, and that's the depth of the crisis that we're looking at. And by the way, that underemployment issue was true back in the good old days before the pandemic. So absolutely, it is a it is a persistent problem. It's particularly bad when when we've got these moments of crisis. Yep. Um, and the the other thing to note too is that there are there are other systemic problems about people who um, just retire in, mm. in in the midst of a bad moment. They're close to retirement. They would have worked longer anyway but now they'll just, they'll just retire and take themselves out of the job market. That skews the rates lower than it probably is. And we probably won't see this quite so soon, but we will as the recovery persists. There's also the discouraged worker, yeah. a person who has looked for so long and still can't find a job that they just give up. Hmm. So they're no longer attached to the labor market. They're no longer looking for work so they can no longer collect unemployment insurance or they, they may have already exhausted their unemployment insurance. And once they stop looking, they fall out of that number as well. This was a big problem in the recovery from the Great Recession, 
we started seeing numbers come down, the unemployment rate came down when things were still really bad, both because of the rate doesn't account for underemployment and it doesn't account for the discouraged worker. Okay, so we gave a little bit of that policy background and um, I talked longer than I wanted to about this because I really wanted to get to the real meat of this conversation, which is we've got lots of viewers and lots of people out there who, as I said in the top of the show, probably have not encountered the system, may never have applied for unemployment, or if they applied for unemployment, they at least had some access to someone on the phone, they were able to apply mm -hmm. perhaps online, and now I think there's been a tremendous amount of frustration. The stories have been all over the press and nationally about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people not being able to actually get into the system to apply. So let's start with some basics. If you wanted to apply for unemployment and you wanted to get access to the money, who's covered in the old days, meaning before the pandemic? Generally speaking, if you are an employee who loses your job through no fault of your own, you would be entitled to unemployment insurance as long as you have earned sufficient wages over the past 18 months. And generally speaking, you don't need to earn tremendous amounts of wages, but that 18 months is, is the base period. And we wanna see that you work sufficiently during that time that you're actually attached to the workforce. Mm. Um, three things are important there, an employee, meaning that you're not an independent contractor, you're not self-employed. This is for people who get W-2s at the end of the year for the wages that they earn. Um, so if you had a 1099, at least in the old days, and we'll talk about the pandemic insurance, if you were a 1099 worker, you could not apply for UI. Correct, you're completely shut out of it in the old days. Mm -hmm. The second thing I talked about is you have to lose your job through no fault of your own. Right? And that means not for misconduct. Mm. It doesn't mean that you know, perhaps you just weren't fit for the job or your performance wasn't satisfactory and you were let go for that. That's, that's okay, that is not disqualifying for UI. But you can't have committed any sort of misconduct, like right. you know, repeatedly breaking rules, showing up late, uh, insubordination. And you can't have engaged in gross misconduct, such as you know, harassing or assaulting people on the job. So that's number two. You have now to one, one question I would ask is quickly on that. How does the Department of the Unemployment Insurance folks even know that that occurs? As soon as you apply for unemployment, the next thing they're going to do is send notice to your employer mm. and ask, why were you let go? Mm. And the employer then will let them know the reasons. Or in, in general, they'll, they'll say it was not for misconduct or if it was misconduct, they will specify what it is. So mm -hmm. the employer has a role in this system as well. And, and then the third thing is that you have to be sufficiently attached to the workforce. Mm -hmm. If you've only been working for a couple of weeks, you may not have enough wages in your base period in order to be eligible for unemployment. Now, I think one of the most important things, and frankly, I think it's an outrage that you outline here is the third bullet point in this slide, that unemployment insurance only replaces an average of 40% of your income. And I find that to be completely outrageous because many people, for many people, 40% is not livable. You are only able to sort of struggle through. It's not really a wage to keep you uh, financed, keep, to be able to keep you able to pay the bills that you paid before when you're working full time. And as you point out before, as we've already discussed, your unemployment came through no fault of your own, and yet you're being penalized by the system. Right. You're absolutely right, Jonathan. And, and I should note that 40% is the average across the country. Again, in those southeastern states, of earlier and, and some of the other um, more red states, not all of them, but many of them, the replacement rates are much lower than that. And they top out in the low 200s a week, no matter how much you make. So the replacement rates can be a lot lower. UI was a system that was built in response to the Great Depression. And yes, it was about providing income support to individuals, but it was also about providing what we call counter cyclical economic mm -hmm. stimulus, meaning that when times are bad, this is a way to inject more money into local economies 
by giving it to people who are going to spend it right away on groceries, on you know things they need from local mom and pop shops. It's it's a way to keep economies going even when there is an economic downturn. All right, so now we're going to move to some of the what I call the non-COVID common UI questions because they are relevant even in the COVID pandemic period. So as we're looking at this next slide, there are really three basic things to address. So people, again, know the practicalities of this. Let's say you've worked in lots of different states. Where should you apply? If you've worked in multiple states, you should apply in the state where there is the highest weekly benefit, mm -hmm. the highest maximum benefit. Because if you've worked, for example, in uh, a state where there's a $250 benefit or, and then you've worked in a state where there's a $600 benefit, you are going to get more UI in the state with the higher benefit. So and that's can, still true now, even with it these absolutely pandemics. absolutely is. Okay. It, it's absolutely true. You can Google state maximum UI benefits state by state. You can find out which one is the highest and that's the state where you should apply. All right, so now I'm ready to apply. I either am calling someone on the phone, probably I can't get through because I'm gonna get busy signals everywhere, but let's say I have to fill out a form. Hopefully I can print it out online. I can fill it out and drop it in the mail, if not somehow email it. I, well, I think in it's- In fact, Jonathan, um, the preferred method in all states and territories in the District of Columbia that have UI programs is that you apply online. Yeah. Um, that is, the, and that is, it is an access issue. It's one of the things that's made it harder for some people, but you have to go to your state's unemployment insurance mm -hmm. agency website, read all of the instructions they have about the kind of information and materials that you need before you start to apply, and they will take you through an online application through which you can apply for your benefits. But usually, most states have some very specific things that are probably uniform across states that you need, right? So you probably what need your pay stub, the times of your employment, just give us the, the top three or four or five things you absolutely always need to have at your beck and call. You'll need your social security number, your address. You will need to know probably first date of employment and last date of employment. They will ask if you are working any sort of part-time hours now, mm -hmm. either for the current employer or for somebody else. And it varies by state what the impact of that will be. Some states allow you to collect partial benefits, some don't. Um, but you know, they're, you're going to have to give fully accurate information because if it's found out that you're making money that's not that you're not reporting in, um, you can be then hit with penalties and repayment and perhaps uh, criminal penalties as well. So it's, it's important to get the information right. And you also have to promise or at least declare that you are ready to actively look for work. And then as you continue to receive the benefits, you have to say, hey, I'm trying to look for work. But I wonder, has that requirement changed at all in the pandemic, given the level of unemployment and the fact is that there aren't jobs out there? Is there any more flexibility on that specific point? There is. As you, as you said, as a general rule, people have to be actively seeking work. And there are some states that make you report in, for example, three, four, five, or six contacts per week where you are looking for work. Um, states have been given the authority by the U.S. Department of Labor to, to relax those standards right now, especially more towards the beginning of the pandemic when, when people were just shedding jobs like crazy. Um, and, and there certainly is a recognition that there are only so many jobs to be looking for right now. Mm. But an important corollary of that, though, is that you also must accept suitable work when offered. Mm. So if you are looking for a job and you get a job offer that is suitable, and suitable means it's something that is comparable in skill and wages and, and you know, economic stature as your previous job, um, you've got to take it absent a good reason. And yeah. if you are called back to your previous job um, you, and you don't have a, a good cause to, re to refuse the job, and we can talk about that, um, you've got to go back to that as well or lose your benefits. I would guess that most people would be very grateful to get back to a job that they had before or even similar work. So now let's move. But let, me, let me just stop you there because there are, there are a few circumstances, right? If somebody is immunocompromised uh, or lives with people who are, they may be afraid to go back yeah, to sure. the right now. And if for some reason you go back and you find that your employer is not taking proper precautions mm. to make sure that they guard against the spread of COVID, 
that may also be a good reason to refuse to go back to work and still collect your unemployment benefits. Well, I wonder on that point, have we heard of those circumstances? I think right away, for example, of retail workers in grocery stores uh, that, or people who are working in poultry plants where we know, especially owned by Tyson Foods, where they've been shut down across the country because Tyson Foods and other poultry processing uh, companies did not take the pro proper precautions. Have we actually heard of people legitimately being able to continue to get unemployment benefits and saying, no, I'm not going to take a job because it's too dangerous? We are. And there are certain mm. states that are going out of their way to make it clear to people they do not have to return to work that is unsafe. There are other states that are taking a very hard line about it, though. And mm. the Department of Labor has yet to, the United States Department of Labor has yet to issue really clear guidance mm. about the right to refuse to return to unsafe work. So it's a little bit murky, although I would say again to my audience that keep that in mind that if you work in an industry, as I mentioned, let's say you worked in retail in a grocery store or you're at a poultry processing plant or you're working in some place where that we would call frontline workers, you potentially have the right and to refuse to go back to that job and still get your unemployment benefits, but it's still a little bit murky. And so I guess what Judy is saying is you probably want to check with state officials. We don't know what the feds are going to say about this, but at least you get some sense from the state folks, right? Correct. Assuming you can get in touch with the state folks. Yes, that's talk it. about how hard it is to get through. But if you can, if you have like concrete demonstrable evidence that they're not engaging in social distancing, mm. that they're not allowing people to wear masks, to wash their hands, to remain sanitary, that there are inappropriate barriers to make sure that there is uh, there isn't transmission from person to person, for example. Those kind of things are, are fairly cut and dried, and, and we would certainly argue that you have every right to return to not to return to an unsafe workplace like that. That's a great point. That's a really valuable point, and I hope my audience remembers that. And obviously, you can reach out to NELP and to Judy at NELP if you have some specific questions. But of course, uh, you can try to get a hold of the State Department of the Unemployment Department, the, uh, usually the Labor Department if you can get through, obviously, but certainly there are advocates like NELP that can really give some guidance and, and presumably that's on your website as well. So it let's- is, and We have a special page for this moment, mm. www.unemployedworkers.org. Ah, oh, great. All sorts of information about your rights for paid sick leave, paid family and medical leave, unemployment insurance, health and safety. And it also has a link to all of the legal service providers throughout the entire country who can help you on a state by state and county by county basis. Ah, that's an awesome resource, awesome resource. We're gonna repeat that again at the end of the show. So get your pens ready, to pencils, pens, computers, your iPads ready so you can type in that URL. Uh, so let's move to the next slide, which actually gets us to the current situation. And that's what's known as the CARES Act, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistant, the CARES Act. Give us the basics of that, what that covers. Sure. Remember, we talked before about, generally speaking, to get UI, you have to be an employee mm. and you have had to have worked there for a while. Um, and that means that anybody who gets paid by a 1099, anybody who uh, is self-employed and makes their own money, um, and, and folks that haven't been all that attached to the workforce yet, aren't eligible for unemployment insurance. And in fact, increasingly, the ways that people are out of work because of the classification of, of type of worker that they are, is rendering them ineligible for the unemployment insurance mm. program. Mm. Um, you know, gig workers throughout the country, we, we are very much of, of the firm position that most of them are in fact employees and they are misclassified as independent contractors, but the companies, Uber, Lyft, Grubhub, uh, Instacart, you know, they all persist in this notion that they are technology companies, not, you know, not the, the service that they're providing. And then the people that work through the apps are independent contractors. Mm. So they've not been paying into the UI programs for that. Right. Okay. So let's look at the specific conditions in this next slide that are covered under the pandemic, the CARES Act. And there's some very interesting twists to this compared to the usual circumstances. And the audience can see here those specifics. And as, as I said before, we'll have them also on our website. So let's talk very quickly about the five points you make that are very different potentially than the usual situation with unemployment benefits. Sure, you, you can be eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance 
if you lose your job, if you have to stay home in quarantine, either because you're sick or you've been advised to quarantine by a medical professional, or you're caring for someone who's sick or has to stay home in quarantine, uh, if your job is closed or you can't get there because of, mm. of travel bans, stay at home orders, uh, then you can also collect pandemic unemployment assistance. If you have to stay home to care for a child or some other dependent member of your family because they can't go to school or summer camp or another program where they go to be taken care of during the day, then you can also collect pandemic unemployment assistance. So it, mm. it really covers a very broad range of the reasons why people are out of work these days that don't have anything to do with necessarily the work itself. Something that's also important with PUA is that you can be eligible if you had a job offer, you didn't start the job, but you had a job offer and the job offer was rescinded or is on hold because of the COVID-19 crisis as well. And there is an application process for PUA as well. And as we can see now in this next slide, there are some very specific things that can happen. So let's go through those very quickly and just make any additional points if you need to clarify, but let's hit those quickly. Sure, so when you apply for pandemic unemployment assistance, you'll first have to be denied for regular UI. So you'll have to go through to your state UI agency website and apply as if you were applying for unemployment insurance. Some states, once they realize you're not entitled to UI, they will automatically consider you for PUA without another application. Some states are making you do a different application. It will just all depend on the state. Mm. The big thing here is you are going to need to provide your own documentation of the wages that you've earned in recent years because nothing has been reported in for you. So anything you have like tax returns, 1099s, any deposit statements and, and bank statements that show deposits of money that are income, uh, even your own affidavit of this is what I have earned and this is how I have earned doing it, and you mm. sign it under the penalty of perjury. All of these things will be considered by state UI agencies as ways to substantiate the money that you've claimed you've earned in recent years in order to justify your, your benefit. And there's been some conversation in progressive communities, and I think it's been touched on a little bit by some of the press. What about my immigration status? If you have work authorization to be in the United States, then odds are you will qualify for unemployment insurance or PUA. Mm. But if you are undocumented, you're not going to be eligible for either of these programs, unfortunately. But mm. people here through TPS, through uh, DACA, uh, you will be eligible to collect a benefit. If you're here on a visa though, that is tied to one particular employer and you can't work for that employer, then you don't have status to be here and you're not considered work authorized and wouldn't be able to get benefits. Now, of course, this is what people are told to do. Here are the rules and here's how you can get it. But as we talked about before, there have been so many problems in terms of the whole system. And so I want to move to this uh, next slide quickly and get you to kind of riff on the problems that we're seeing with actually getting a hold of the unemployment insurance and getting access to the CARES Act and getting this money into people's hands. I mean, people have heard of these stories throughout the country that people have waited for weeks and weeks and sometimes a couple of months before getting the first check. And unfortunately, you know, the bill collectors don't wait. The utilities have to get paid, the rent has to get paid, food has to get paid, and people are not getting their money. I'm going to try to give you a succinct answer, but I have to tell you there are so many reasons and so many problems. Mm. But first of all, we're dealing with ridiculously unprecedented levels of unemployment. Yeah. Uh, before this crisis, the most first-time claims for unemployment we ever saw in a week were in 1982, and it was about 680,000 people. We've seen 3.4 million, 4.5 million, 2.8 million. You know, we're seeing the numbers of applications for just regular old UI at a level we've never seen before. And the state agencies didn't have a chance to gradually build up staff like they usually do when a recession starts to come. This was like a cliff that they fell off. So, so what do I do if I'm the average person? How do I get through that? Is this just the reality that people are going to have to face and that they're is. not going to have money in their pockets because essentially the system is falling apart? 
it, it is a reality that it is going to take longer than usual. Um, but the good news is states, states had to do a lot of reprogramming of their systems to uh, account for the PUA program, as well as something I know we'll talk about, pandemic unemployment compensation, which is an extra $600 per week. Mm. And the reprogramming was a disaster for all of the reasons I talked about earlier, these old computer programs from the 1980s that are patched upon, patched upon, patched upon. But all of those programs are now up and running. All of the states are delivering benefits. Some have been delivering for four or five weeks, some just starting. But the good news is it, it may still take longer to get your benefits than it would have under the best, best of times, if you will. But the states are, they have staffed up, they have reprogrammed, they're beginning to handle the flow better. Hmm. The and here's a question is, I'll bet you that lots of people are gonna wanna know. Let's say I was eligible to get the money in week one, but they only get to my application two months later, and I might only then be in the system two months later. Do I get all that money retroactively to the first week I was eligible? You, under state UI, you will certainly get money that is retroactive to when you applied if hmm. you are eligible at the time of application. PUA is actually, uh, you're eligible for that retroactive to the week of January 27th. Hmm. So if you can document that you started losing hours or losing your job even before you applied and even before this program was operational, you can get retroactive benefits. So it's worth keeping after it because even yes. if you may have a shortfall today in terms of what's actually in your pocket and in your bank account and you're really desperate, I get the idea that people are throwing up their hands and giving up and are very frustrated, but you have to keep in mind that even as bad as the system is, as Judy said, they're catching up a little bit. And at the end of the day, you're going to be made whole. You'll get, well, you'll get that retroactive check. Yes, that's you what I mean. You might not be made whole because if you've got penalties on bills that you've missed. I mean, yes, I mean, you will be made whole by what you're supposed to get from the unemployment system. Not obviously, you'll have to fight with, unfortunately, this is capitalism. You're going to fight with your landlord and other bill collectors. That's a whole different problem. But right. at least in terms of what you are eligible for, you should be able to get that. Correct. And I can't stress this to people enough. Don't give up. <laughs> Some of these programs were designed for you to give up. And if you do, you're just playing into it. Keep applying. Keep getting, you know, every week going in and certifying the, the wages that you haven't made. Um, and, you know, be persistent, try to get people on the phone, try to work through your local state legislators and their mm. constituent service people. Don't give up. So let's now move to the last um, slide that I wanted to introduce to folks and the topic that, that I wanted to talk about, because it's a lot of money, actually. We're kind of ending with another important and positive uh, development and direction and addition to the support that people should get. And then we'll, we'll talk about a couple of policy things at the end, but talk a little bit about now the PUC and the PEUC, the Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, which mm. people have heard a lot about, the extra $600 a week in weekly benefits, and the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation. I'm gonna talk about the second one first, just because hmm. it's just short and simple. Good. You get 13 more weeks of state UI benefits. Mm. You run out of your 26 or whatever your state offers and you still haven't found a job, there are 13 more weeks waiting for you fully funded by the federal government. And the PUA program is 39 weeks long. The PUC, Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, is really a big topic of conversation these days. I, we spoke earlier of how UI only replaces about 40% of wages in the country. And for the average worker, when they get 40% of their wages, they are short about $600 per week. Hmm. So that's why the amount for PUC was set at $600. It is designed to make the average worker whole. For some workers, it won't make them whole. For some workers, it's going to make them more than whole. And the workers who are more than whole, of course, are the ones who are working for wages so low that they can't make ends meet in the first place anyway. Absolutely. So before we talk about a few of the big policy issues and how we move forward. I want you to give that website again that you folks have set up with all the details and all the resources. Sure, it's www.unemployedworkers.org. And we've got resources on unemployment insurance and all of the different programs. 
We've got resources on worker health and safety, mm. paid sick leave, paid family and medical leave, uh, as well as links that will help you find legal service providers in your community if you feel like any of your rights are being violated. Mm. All of the information is in English, much of it is in Spanish, some is in Chinese, and we're continuing to work on translations into other languages as well. That's great. And I want to emphasize again to my audience what Judy said several times, do not give up. We know it's extremely frustrating to, for folks to either go to a website where the system has crashed and you can't get access to it, or to sit on the phone for hours and hours and hours and often leave a message that says, well, we'll call you back and then you never get a call back. And it's not that the people on the other end, the frontline workers who are really at the phone system, it's not that they don't want to get back to you. It's just the crush, the unbelievable crush because of the unprecedented, really going back to the Great Depression of the 1920s, the unprecedented crisis has just put this system at really a breaking point and it really, underscores how bad the system is, which leads me to these very important last policy questions. The first one actually is, as you point out in the slide that we just saw, the PUC only goes through July 26th. And there seems to be this crazy debate in Congress, mainly coming from Republicans, that they just want to wait and see about how to extend the support for all these millions of people who are out of work. And we know that all those millions of people are not gonna go back to work right away. It could take actually several months, several years, and some yeah. of those jobs are just gonna disappear. People are not gonna have that uh, job. And Republicans particularly, I, I haven't heard Democrats say this, although there've been some Democrats who also have said, well, let's wait and see. I just don't get this, other than it's this distaste for people who are unemployed that's ideologically based from Republicans who just love the free market, love capitalism, and they don't see the real crisis that average people are mm -hmm. undergoing. And it's insane that they wouldn't immediately extend this, not to mention expand it, which I'm going to come to in a second about some other broad issues. So what's, what's your sense of that? Yeah, there's this, this you know, faux moral outrage, if you will, that there are people who are actually making more money being unemployed than they were when they yeah. were working their jobs. And, and the outrage about that should be that they were making so damn little money when they were working that, that unemployment benefits and even the $600 a week is, is more money than they made working. So that's where the outrage should be. Um, and, and it is not a disincentive to work because no. as we've stated before, you can't voluntarily quit or voluntarily refuse to go back to your job without a good reason and still keep collecting unemployment insurance. Mm. People want to get back to work. People don't want to stay home and be isolated all day. Work is how we normalize our lives. It's how we support ourselves. It's how we get social interaction. So this, this notion that people are enjoying staying home, collecting unemployment benefits is, is a fallacy to say the least. And, and I know that there are those, including the president, who love to talk about the recovery and how great America is and will bounce back. <laughs> but econ economists from every part of this yeah. political and the, um, the ideological spectrum are telling us this is going to be at least a two-year rebuilding process. Businesses, you know, states don't snap a finger and then everything opens and it goes back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. There are phases. There are... Um, stages that people are going to have to go through of partial reopening and then fuller reopening. We've got to have a consumer group that is confident enough in their safety to go back to restaurants, to go back to stores that weren't essential, to, to go back into their old regular way of doing things. Mm. And then we've got some industries, and in particular, I would talk about the performing arts. Yep. And, and I don't just mean, you know, the, the musicians that put on a con concert and actors and actresses that are on a stage, but, but all of the people, the concessioners, the, the technicians, the business people, think about live sports as well. All of the people who go into those fields, when, when we're all sitting crammed together in tight spaces, yelling and shouting, it's, it's not going to be safe to reopen those types of enterprises anytime soon. So there are big chunks of the economy mm. that just aren't going to reopen at all. 
And the last question I'd ask you, if I was to give you the magic wand, and I'm going to ask you to answer this in, in two minutes. I know this is going to be a challenge, but I know you're up to it. I am. I know if, what you're going to ask, and I know what I'm going to say. Okay, let's see if you were telepathic, and or I'm so obvious. If you had this magic wand, and after this crisis uh, uh, abates, which, as we just said, is going to take several years, and you were able to change the system, and I, I want to make it in broad strokes, what would you do so that if we come to another crisis, or frankly, just within the day-to-day -day reality of people who come in and out of employment, how would you change the system to make it, you know, not... Uh, so harsh for people to actually get support, which we should want to do as a society. The first thing we need to do is appropriate about $50 billion to be spent over the next three to five years. And uh, the technology folks at DOL, the United States Department of Labor, need to oversee every state as it scraps old bad technology and upgrades it to systems that can handle the modern days, that can reprogram, that can handle a heavy flow of benefits and that aren't impenetrable to the people who want to apply. Mm. We need to make sure every state has a mandatory minimum of at least 26 weeks of unemployment. We need to replace at least 60% of wages, if mm. not more. We need to make sure that we, uh, enact certain reforms that we know will expand eligibility for part-time workers, for women, for people who are experiencing domestic violence, for people who have to transfer jobs because their spouses were transferred. Um, and we need to put responsibility on state UI agencies to get out there and publicize the availability of benefits. Mm. The single biggest reason why people don't collect UI is because they don't know that they're entitled to it. So we need to make sure people know that when they lose their job through no fault of their own, they are entitled to unemployment. Finally, we need to expand unemployment insurance to make sure that it is available for people who are legitimately self-employed, give them a way to pay in for it themselves, but also crack down on all of the misclassification of people who are called independent contractors, but really are employees. And we should pay into the system for them as well so they can collect UI when times are tight. And all those practical ideas, which are fantastic points, they really t talk to the big point, which is being on unemployment should not be seen as something negative or a comment on your character. We should look right. at it as something as a society that we embrace and that we think is a good thing to extend to people because we live in this free market capitalist system where people are at the mercy of corporations, of doing their bidding, changing their decisions on production, firing people, laying off people. We should not be the ones suffering from that. Correct. It is unemployment insurance. You've paid into it, so you should collect it. You don't feel ashamed when you go to the doctor and then you collect it and, and, and insurance pays for that. You don't feel shame when it, you are in a car accident and insurance pays for that. You shouldn't feel shame when you lose your job through no fault of your own because that's the nature of the workforce and you should collect unemployment insurance for that period. So as we close the show, I wanna thank again, Judy Conti for coming on the show. Our TV and audio editor is David Hebden. Our major sponsor, as usual, is the American Postal Workers Union. You, too, can become a sponsor, either a one-time donor or an ongoing recurring supporter. You can do that, again, as I said before, in two ways. You can go to workinglife.org. You can click on that podcast tab, and that'll help you follow your way over to a link to Patreon. Or you can use something that lots of people are familiar with, and that's ActBlue. We're a new client of ActBlue. You go over to Act Blue, look for Working Life Network, become a recurring donor, a one-time donor. Either way, we'd appreciate it. Helps us fund these fancy bookcases behind me or this fancy studio with all these lights glaring on me. As we grow, we want you to be a partner here. We want you to help spread the notion and the ideas of this show. This is really designed to help working people as we tried to do here with this segment, this long segment on the unemployment system. Do write to me, jtassini at workinglife.org. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.